now, deep in the British jungle. JBW. Hello there. In this video, I'm going to attempt to convey to you a theory which I deduced last year in an attempt to find some grain of logic in the megalithic tradition. That presumed craft which gave rise to the construction of megalithic works found right around the globe. Those monuments and structures built out of colossal bodies of stone. This talk is also in part an introduction to accompany a film I published last year called The Stonesmith and the Dragon in Eden. There is a trailer and links to that film on my YouTube channel here, should it be of interest to you. That film was an attempt to present the broad body of research which I undertook in the formulation of this theory and in that you will find a great deal to think about to accompany what I am going to discuss here. I attempted to make something like one of those educational films Neo was injected with in the Matrix. Should you watch that film I encourage you to do so in, as with this talk, an open-minded manner and let the information flow over you as it was intended. As with all histories, outside the purely technical study of artefacts, there is a great deal of conjecture necessary in order to join up the dots. My theory here is no different. Though I have endeavoured um, to conduct technical experiments to prove the Unheated. theory put forward to you here. Uh, Cornish granite. I am not entirely confident as yet of my results, though I have had several positive outcomes from those this tests. This end has been heated. Therefore, I encourage you to look upon red. this talk and the theory which I lay out before you with an open mind as something to consider, build upon, and perhaps, should it be of interest to you, conduct your own experiments to define whether you think there is some truth in it or not. One of the reasons I'm publishing this work in this inconclusive state is that, due to the theories I put forward here, spanning a colossal body of information in the data of countless megalithic sites around the world, also the colossal time spans involved and the broad array of academic disciplines which this theory touches upon, whether it be technical histories of mining, quarrying um, or indeed theological subjects, mythology, anthropology, there is enough there to keep several universities going, potentially, for several centuries. For that reason, I hope you will forgive me in presenting this in this open and artistic manner, so as perhaps others will take an interest in this, and then perhaps we will be able to define together whether what I am touching upon here does indeed hold a grain of truth. To begin, I would like to pose to you three questions. Firstly, something which has always bothered me as a craftsman and a maker of things. Why the megalithic? Why? Why did they insist on building things in these absurd proportions? What sane man would make such a choice? Particularly if their tools were harder to use than ours, what would possess them to, around the entire globe, indulge in these megalithic architectural pursuits? 
what is behind it. I personally have a great deal of faith in the ability of human craftsmen and human ingenuity. I have myself witnessed the work of incredible craftsmen and women, instrument makers, sculptors, smiths, um, any number of things you only have to open your eyes and see. The incredible produce of human ingenuity and our crafts. We are capable of incredible things. And yet, looking at the megalithic age, the pyramids, Machu Picchu, Stonehenge, and the endless uh, similar wonders across the Far East, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, across the African continent, across the Americas, Russia, perhaps even, perhaps even Australasia. Point being, what initiated this global trend towards building megalithic structures? It makes no blinking sense. Why not just build things out of little pieces of stone like any normal person? Why would you put yourself through such a trial? Was it some kind of megalithic arms race? What the hell was it? Hmm. So that I thought on for many years, and I have a proposition to answer it. But before that, question number two. How was metal smelting discovered? Hmm? I ask you that. Again, if you have half a mind, it would be fair to assume, or though it would be incorrect, but they had a bit of copper ore, they lit a campfire, they smelted metal. It happened by accident, but it can't. That campfire, think about it, burns at half the temperature. So you've got to create yourself a pair of bellows, pump it like Billy Go, in order to raise it to a temperature of over a thousand degrees and there hold it in order to smelt your lump of copper ore. Now if you get into iron and all the rest of it, temperatures getting higher uh, incrementally. However, at that most basic level we have the significant problem that you cannot smelt metal by accident. With a campfire or cooking fire, it simply will not happen. More of that in a moment. Thirdly, have you ever noticed, hmm, I ask you, that the legend, myth, whatever you want to call it, symbol, icon, of the dragon, indeed the dragon, serpent, and perhaps having evolved from including the snake and wyrm in the old English tongue, W-Y-R-M, the wyrm, formerly uh, the title given to the dragon, why is likewise that fantastical creature found interwoven throughout the myths, legends and religions of the entire globe? Now then, there are of course those who say, oh well, the ancients simply discovered the bones of a dinosaur and thereafter arose the dragon myth. It may be the case with the Cyclops, for example, in one small locality it appears there were um, elephant skulls to be found which do have the resemblance of a one-eyed monster, a monster with the eye in its centre of its head, that being the hole where the trunk uh, extends from on the elephant skull. However, a beast such as the serpent or dragon which is seen in every culture and which is elevated often to take the highest place, the Chinese dragon stands beside it is the emperor's symbol, bringer of good fortune. Likewise in the ancient Greeks and so on and so forth, even the Vikings, the dragon is right at the beginning of their creation myths, the giant serpent Jormungandr in the Viking tradition. Why? Why did they all go on about dragons, serpents? Were they completely insane? I think not. I think they were very intelligent. I think they had all the capacities that we have today. They had less technology. But I think all the more reason for them to be, uh, to hold a certain amount of common sense. Um, it is 
prevalent in their artworks. They generally document realities of hunting and the like. They were clearly very, very practical people. So why the dragon? The rest of it makes relative sense. They have men with horns on their heads. They were learning how to investigate cattle. Yes, I can see it. They have a man with a fish on his head. Fishing produced a huge amount of their food. It makes sense to make a fisherman with a fish hat on. The lion, a symbol of prowess and great strength for the warriors. Likewise the eagle, the all-knowing sight from above. Again, it makes sense. I see it. Their practical symbols later becoming esoteric uh, iconography. The evolution is there to see for anybody with half a mind. And yet, in amongst them, often holding pride of place above them all, a snake. <laughs> of all the animals he could choose, why would the pharaoh choose a snake? What is it he associates himself with? Why would he identify his lineage with the snake of all creatures? That pestilent fiend found lying beneath the rock. Who is he trying to impress with this snake? In our legends, the Pendragon cast into the lineage of King Arthur. The head of the dragon, the serpent, once again the pinnacle, the creation of a nation. What a confounding station. There is no such thing as dragons. It's a creation of the human mind, quite clearly. Yet why? Why did it endure all those thousands of years? Why is it there at the centre in all these separate cultures? Some ten years ago, when that problem first hit me full in the face, I did not dare approach it, for I had other things to do. But I did approach it last year, and likewise I have a proposition for you as to why perhaps the dragon features and is so significant in our cultural history. <laughs> Gods or nay, they could create. I once uh, visited my uncle. At the time, there was a gentleman doing metalwork in the Bronze Age tradition, as they believe those works were carried out. And he'd set himself up a little smelting forge, excuse the tree. And within that forge, he was smelting bronze and creating a bronze sword, which he did before our very eyes. And to carry out that feat, he took two stones, two thin, long rectangular stones, within the inner surface where those two stones met, he carved out the indentation of a Bronze Age sword on either side, put those two stones together, took his crucible full of molten bronze, poured in that glowing golden liquid. It was quite a magical sight to watch. Then, a very short moment afterwards, he drew the sword from the stone. And at that point, my uncle looked over to me and said, Jess, do you think perhaps that's where the sword in the stone myth originated. Being as I was a metal worker at the time and doing some casting and forging myself, I thought, I tell you what, you've probably got a point there. I think the blacksmithing community is well aware of the uh, relevance of the sword in the stone and see Arthur as a, something of a patron saint of their craft. Because of the obvious parallels um, between his drawing of the sword from the stone 
and the craft of metalworking. After all, you can see it in several different ways, in a direct way like that, where literally the sword is being literally pulled from the stone in a uh, casting operation. Or likewise, you can look at it in a little bit more symbolic way and consider the ore stone being transformed into the sword, drawing again the sword from the body of the stone itself, from the ore stone. So there is another little thought which was present amongst those three major questions when I approached this issue a year ago and began a f seriously concerted effort to find some sense in the megalithic tradition. So, let us move on to consideration of Aswan Quarry in Egypt, where the unfinished obelisk is found. I stumbled across that obelisk last year and it entirely blew my mind. Looking at Aswan Quarry, it was immediately obvious to me that I was a complete and utter novice once more in regarding their work. So it was that I decided I would spend some time examining that site and take that challenge to see if I could discern some kind of logic to their working practices. Through that endeavour I could perhaps deduce, at least to begin with, which end of the workpiece they started at, for example, and some basic principles from which I might be able to gain some insight into what was going on there. Because the reality is, it does appear they were carving out that obelisk out of the granite bedrock with an alien laser butter knife technology. And that I was not prepared to accept. Now then, to give you the picture, there were several things which concerned me immediately upon looking at that site. They had their workpiece and then a channel cut where they had quarried out the stone. And on the opposite side, you saw these uh, strangely uniform, strangely organic, smooth, sculpted troughs flowing over the granite bedrock. On a surface which was not even connected to the workpiece, a surface that would be staying in the quarry. In other words, that was their course working. S the signature of their course cut left on an off cut. And yet that coarse cut left this curiously smooth, sculpted trough, some 30 to 40 centimetres wide. Very, very curious indeed. The contemporary stone cutter does anything other than channeling out a great wide gully through the stone. Because it's an incredibly inefficient way of quarrying. You are much better off taking your iron chisel or pick, creating a small cleft and driving in an, a wedge, cracking the stone. However, being that they didn't have iron wedges, it is reasonable to assume that they were using another method. There are two unfinished pieces in, in Aswan. The unfinished obelisk itself and then up the hill a little bit, there's another unfinished piece, particularly on that second site. If you look closely, you can see that there's an overhang at the top of that channel. Again, it makes very little sense because if you are going to cut into the ground, You generally cut straight down. You carve out straight down, whether it be stone or whatever. And it's a waste of time to leave an overhang 
requires quite a concerted effort. And if this surface, if that surface is not even part of the workpiece, why on earth would you bother cutting an overhang on the top of that gully? It makes no blinking sense. Yes. So, two very serious problems. Now, likewise, there is it as when um, around the quarried piece, holes bored into the bedrock appear to be made of four circles, creating one large radius square hole, so to speak. So, curiouser and curiouser. On the top of the obelisk, you can see there are these, um, it's cut away, and looks rather like a, the surface of a golf ball. The horizontal surfaces in uh, contrary to those vertical planes, the horizontal surfaces have this uh, are scooped out like the surface of a golf ball. Scoop, 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 scoop in a grid-like pattern. But it's not a uniform grid either. And none of it makes a blinking bit of sense. So, to state the obvious, but nonetheless, why didn't they use on the horizontal surfaces, why didn't they have that same fluidity to their cutting method that we see on the vertical surfaces? Why did they restrain themselves to cutting these curious little uh, golf ball-esque indentations in a grid-like pattern that doesn't quite match up? Why would they do that when they've got this really easy, beautiful looking way of, of working on those vertical surfaces in cutting their channels? What the Blinking hell are they doing? Drives me around the blooming bend. These Egyptians. There's another issue, and that is on the unfinished obelisk itself. The cuts down the stone are more or less those curious troughs, are more or less vertical. Yet on the other one, you can see them clearly swooping over the surface of the granite and following and, and, and wandering off in a uh, less than vertical manner. There's curiously organic. Oh. So there's a few other things that are worth bearing in mind. Should you yourself take a look at that Aswan Quarry site? Firstly, there are several places on that site where they have channeled out gully as we see around the obelisk itself and afterwards after that work has been completed the stone above that channel has been cracked off sheared off leaving the edge of that scooping method exposed and that looks particularly perplexing secondly there are in the obelisk a couple of points where Later on, a later period of Egyptian quarrymen has come along and attempted to saw that obelisk up with an abrasive, it appears to have been done with a copper blade imbued with an abrasive dust, corundrum I think it's called, conundrum, and uh, therein they've sawed, attempted to saw through that block. Again, a later period signature. Otherwise, the Aswan Quarry site, it's worth noting that they were right next to um, the Nile. That quarry is, uh, and according to what I've read, they thought that they, it's thought that they had barges entering the quarry itself and coming over, it was possible to get a barge right up next to that unfinished obelisk. So in my mind, the transport of those obelisks is not something which uh, need be um, well it's more or less explained already Aww. adding to that 
there are few, there are now relatively uh, sensible explanations of how the pyramid um, of how the pyramids themselves were were raised and how the how that uh, how that work could be completed with the level of technology they we we know they had. Um, and I've seen some amazing work done by a by an old lad in um, in the states, shifting huge great boulders around on pebbles, um, and he shows how they can be how he he can lift on his own a, a, a colossal block weighing several tons just by uh, using simple seesaw methods, putting wedges under and lifting it up slowly. Some very clever work I saw recently of a chap who'd suggesting that the blocks could be flipped up the side of a pyramid um, to in its building and that the proportions for that worked and you could actually see a central um, what looked like four gullies left in the pyramid as it was being built for that purpose likewise at um, for example at the in easter island we've seen how they those heads can be walked and that's been practiced and they've they've seen that that is actually possible so here my interest and this what i'm about to lay out before you is involving the sculpting on, and the, the methodology for their sculpting that is what i'm i'm uh, interested in now then before we go any further i must say and we must pay due respect to the standing theories at the moment the first of them is that the work was done with dolomite pounding stones because at the quarry site amongst other things they found a large quantity of dolomite um, stones dolomite uh, which is harder than granite the assumption was that they were taking those stones and pounding against the granite bedrock and thus boring out those scoops quartz However, a piece of slate firstly well consider the impact on the body of pounding a lump of dolomite against a granite bedrock for hours and hours and hours on end I've done about 30 seconds and my fingers are all tingling Apparently they bounced it. So the assumption is, presumably, that they had a large chain gang, if you like, of slaves and that they were working in a formation and thereby creating this strange signature. Here's problem number two. What sort of crack has foreman got these blokes to do that? Look at that golf balling business going on on those horizontal surfaces it, none of it flipping adds up if you try to do that as I did in my imagination and on a piece of paper for many long hours you would spend far longer working on the logistics of arranging that synchronized chipping team of Egypt into that configuration copper chisels copper chisels for quarrying granite bedrock in ancient Egypt they had an unusual uh, seam of copper which was high in arsenic and therefore when they smelted it as is my understanding it produced something nearing bronze which is quite a bit harder than copper nonetheless there have been suggestions of scraping scraping with a piece of flint or chitting or the like likewise as far as I know none of that was really found there a thousand ton obelisk scraping it out with a little flint out of the raw granite bedrock it still none of it makes a flaming bit of sense we're gonna get to the bottom of this so around about here in my deductive reasoning laughably studying images and video google being as it is due to my searching 
of ancient Egyptian quarry sites, well, Google started providing me with other examples from around the world of that same method. Lo and behold, megalithic temples of the Aztec peoples also incorporates a signature in their quarrying sites and on the face of their megalithic constructions matching that scooping seen in Aswan Quarry. It was all starting to get just a little bit weird. <laughs> and I was starting to be inclined towards this ancient race of high technology beings and that was the last thing I could allow to happen. However, all the flipping same, I took a glance, didn't I, fool that I am, at Stonehenge. Our good old Stonehenge. Five thousand year old Stonehenge. Set on the Salisbury Plains, quarried in the land of the dragons. Paraded across the British Isles and planted there. A monument to the ages. There in the middle of Stonehenge. Laying on its back, there lies the altar stone. And on the back of the altar stone is the very same work signature. Right there on Salisbury Plain, the very centre of the British Isles culturally speaking. Further afield, there are very similar signatures to be seen in the Far East, in Sri Lanka, Cambodia, in their megalithic traditions. Nonetheless, it hap was happening at different times. Easter Island, if you look at images of those quarry sites, which are, again, available you will see a very similar working method to that seen at Aswan. The head is laying in the, the head is quarried out of the bedrock while well, it's laying flat on its back and around it you see these great wide channels cut. So by now, like me, you are up to your neck in unknowns. That's where discovery happens. Enter the Norwegians. A team of Norwegians noted that at, at the Aswan Quarry site there was found large quantities of charcoal and large quantities of mud bricks found in the refuse of the site. Like, likewise a large amount of scalloped, flaked uh, pieces of granite were found. So, they endeavoured to explore the possibility that fire was being used at Aswan. Now here is where things get a little bit... <sighs> the dots and things become a little bit disparate. Because... It is widely known in the history of mining that fire setting, the use of fire to destructively work stone, i.e. if you put rocks around a campfire, when the morning comes they are often shades of red and yellow and they are cracked in half. It is a craft of sorts, a very simple one, basically light a fire under a boulder, it starts cracking, you can pour water on it which will quench that stone and potentially cause it to crack further. When the Norwegian team arrived on site that was already an established theory to clear away the burden of that low quality granite on the surface of the site prior to the workings we see. However, these crafty Norwegians went away and did some tests. And I'll put a link to their uh, paper below. 
And in that short paper that they produced, they noted that the temperatures as low as 200 degrees, the silica in the granite, which is more or less glass, expanded at a different rate from that other 30% of the material granules making up that stone and that accelerated expansion of the silica portion meant bonds were broken between it and those other materials weakening its structural integrity captain that struck me like a slap in the face with a wet haddock 200 degrees you could weaken it and then perhaps scrape it away or knock it away more easily not fire setting that we know today that destructive force which we use just to shatter stone but there was another effect there one that wasn't utilized today another effect which we don't take advantage of the weakening of the stone the annealing of the stone another angle on which to approach working stone with fire is the saturation of stone it's well known that if you take a rock from a river a wet rock when it's placed next to the fire the water heats up very quickly compared to the body of that stone creating pockets of steam inside that rock the expansion of which can lead to a serious explosion well within limits but the stone shatters dramatically letting out a jet of vapor and potentially firing fragments of stone into your face however consider what would happen if you controlled that saturation could you potentially saturate up to a certain depth and then introduce heating and through that controlled saturation separate off a certain amount of the stone hmm. and here's another thought if rock is at sub-zero temperatures and you introduce a fire there's a big heat differential there to crack that stone hmm. so we've got the potential of weakening the stone annealing it and then working it we've got the potential of using saturation in that process control in a controlled manner to increase it we have large quantities of charcoal found on the site and we have mud bricks on top of that we have this curious overhang at the top of their channels which makes no sense if you come in from above we've got these vertical scoops and on the top surfaces, horizontal surfaces, we have this curious difficulty producing this golf balling effect. Well, there we go. Consider, with a fire, the most efficient way of working is to heat above the fire, obviously. So, if you work a fire underneath the stone, you bore down as best you can, which is probably time-consuming effort and less efficient. You get down, get to your lowest point, then you work a fire into the body of the stone and you extract the stone around that, shifting out the waste, potentially building the fire up on bricks, using the bricks to focus it, scraping, scratching away the stone which is affected by the fire, which will naturally form a sphere in the body of the stone if the fire is here the heating will form a semicircular profile beneath the fire or alongside it or above it wherever the fire likewise must be of certain dimensions at their minimum get below 30 centimeters and it's hard to get a really strong fire so there are certain 
limitations there. You simply cannot make a very hot, uh, long-lasting fire that big. It needs to be a certain amount of size to hold its heat. Hmm. Is it just me, or is there a logic unfolding there? That could potentially create an organic flowing cut running up the face of that granite bedrock. If they had developed a craft there from fire setting due to their inability to smelt iron and create iron tools, they came up with a whole craft, could they have done, with their innate stone-aged specialism of working stone with fire. Let us think on this. Consider then, if your tool for working the stone by default bores a hole of a minimum size of some 30 to 40 centimeters, in quarrying using that method You might imagine the game of snake. At points, if you were trying to part one large body of stone from another and you channel down between with your worm-like cutting method, if you wanted to leave it attached, those pieces of stone would form nodules, tabs, if you will, if you imagine an airfix model, between the bodies of stone. That would create a method of securing that workpiece whilst that cut was made, and then at the last moment, as you might in uh, wood turning, you will eventually you thin down those tabs until they snap, until they break off, parting the stone. It's worth noting that in Yangshan Quarry, Yangshan Quarry in China, there are pieces remaining in that quarry, which apparently were due to be to create a dragon for the emperor, a cancelled commission. And on those remaining pieces, there are likewise found strange nodules protruding from the worked face of the stone. Again, a gram of logic. Shortly after having conceived the possibility of there being a lost craft of working stone with fire, I met up with my young nephew, Maxo. Being that he is an inquisitive fellow, I mentioned to him this theory. And before I'd finished my first sentence, he butted in and said, oh yeah, I went camping last weekend with Obi, who's my other nephew, we put these rocks around the fire, got them out of the river, and they started exploding. It was well cool. Well, we went and ran back to the river, got more rocks, put them around the fire, and they started exploding. Then we started heating up rocks in the fire and throwing them into the river. Jesus. <laughs> right, let's cancel the fire. Point being, there it appeared. It was starting to happen all over again. Two young lads with their natural curiosity with nothing to do. What do they start doing? Playing with fire. What's next to that fire? Rock. What do they start experimenting with? The effects of fire on stone. Is it not an accident waiting to happen? Is it not logical that should there be a craft potentially held within that effect, that it would reoccur right around the globe again and again and again? Perhaps the conclusion is that that was a false presumption, my prior question, in that there was no single megalithic age, but many megalithic ages, 
as they moved through that stage of working stone with fire. Before they stumbled upon the metals within that stone. Which leads us on to answer how did we stumble upon the smelting of metals? Primarily copper to begin with. Well there we go. If they were getting high temperature fires working inside the body of their stone during the quarrying of their megalithic works, if those were being fueled with charcoal, bellows of some, some description perhaps may have been present, or if not, the simple form of the channel may have created at points a uh, stronger induction of air under the fire than uh, with a normal campfire. The channels drawing the air through the stone, so to speak, creating stoves, if you will, in that body of the stone as they moved the fire through it. Therein might it have been possible, should they have encountered an ore stone in that work, for them to smelt that stone in place. Could it then be that those craftsmen previously engaged in, in those megalithic arts naturally evolved into the first smiths. Therein sealing the fate, as it were, that those megalithic arts would become obsolete given time. The signature left by that fire setting activity um, can be seen to match what are known as ancient fire setting mining sites where there is again this smooth um, radius surface left around where they are quarrying into the stone or mining into the into the rock as opposed to that shattering seen in contemporary fire setting also their eventual evolution into the smelting of iron itself completely eradicated the necessity to work stone in such an inefficient way and allowed for the first time them to efficiently break stone into small parts and work with that instead of being forced to follow these megalithic principles it is fair to assume that were there a prior highly developed craft with masters holding knowledge of their local stone with the introduction of iron tools, a suddenly universal method to work all stone, is it not then possible that all of the prior knowledge of those former masters was forgotten? much as we see having happened with the traditional carpentry skills over the last century with the introduction of machine tools the traditional skills of the old village carpenter have quickly evaporated and a modern carpenter contemporary carpenter generally has a much reduced knowledge of the hand tools and methods of his forefathers. Both can produce elaborate works but they are of two different character types. So we have answered potentially two of our three questions. Firstly, why the megalithic age? Because then, perhaps, to them, it was common sense. How was metal smelting discovered? Perhaps 
It evolved out of the megalithic craft. And we have but one disconnected question. A question no mortal man should ask. But why, at the pinnacle of all those cultures, seemingly, did I find the worm, the serpent, snake, cobra, the dragon? Why? Why? The question burned into my mind. Why the dragon? Madness, you may well say. Madness, perhaps. I concluded so. And yet, when I had first envisaged in my mind's eye those quarrymen bent crouched beside that fire in ancient Egypt burrowing through the stone what was the name I gave to that craft wormery because I could not help but draw the parallel between those legends of the worm, that beast burrowed beneath the mountain, sat upon a hoard, sometimes on occasion of gold and gemstones, fire breathing. The parallel was waiting to be drawn. The allegory was right. And so I did entitle it Wormery, and thought little more of it. However, as I progressed, there that darnable worm sat upon the pharaoh's very brow, a cobra, at the head of those megalithic traditions in the Far East, born and related to the Hindu traditions. Likewise, that cobra, the Naga god, coming out of prehistory, the serpent in China, likewise the serpent, above it all, flying, evolving out of prehistory. <sighs> Genuinely, I feared it. It had an ominous presence when I looked upon it truthfully. I wondered what would become of me if I looked further through that lens. But after some months I could ignore it no longer. And I let the thought play upon my mind. The Pendragon, father of King Arthur, who drew the sword from the stone, Uther Pendragon, Pen, the head of the dragon. That same dragon evolved from the snake and worm, 
flu then, perhaps. Over the metal working arts. Is it perhaps that Arthur, drawing the sword from the stone, describes a third meaning? Is it that art of metalworking? being drawn from the past knowledge of the stonesmiths. Hmm. Those people under that figurehead, would they not become the pharaohs of their people? Those who innovated those arts who created that tradition of the crafts, who approached godliness in that role, who built our civilizations and founded it, might those lineages have been represented under that figurehead? Hmm. Stonehenge, born out of the land of the dragons, where even today that copper red dragon flies. Stonehenge sat in the land of the white dragon. The dragon lies upon those temples in South America too. Could it be that amongst the cowherds, fishermen, hunters, was there another breed, those of the stone, those who burrowed around their fireplaces, eternal flames, forming works to stand for thousands of years. Might it have been the effects of their work which brought them the curse which lasted into our age? Could it be that the havoc they wrought, fueling their mighty aspirations, was their own undoing. Could that be? Why in our cultures the serpent is feared and remembered as ravaging the land? And yet is not the serpent representing that which I describe, representing the innovative spirit of humanity and our creation of ourselves out of Eden. Forbidden, impenetrable, inescapable. Adventure of a lifetime. Do you want to see it? 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 I'm going to do it, boy. Hey. I'm going to do it, boy. Just ask me what to do. I'm going to do it, boy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.